Welcome to In the Know. I'm your host, Dan Reith, and we continue our series on meeting the candidates for the upcoming provincial election on June 2nd. In this episode, we are visiting with Dave Plum, candidate for the Freedom Party of Ontario for Elgin Middlesex London. Dave, welcome to In the Know. Good to be here. Thank you. So tell our viewers a little bit about Dave Plum. Who is he? Why is he running? What's motivated you to seek uh, the seat for Elgin Middlesex London? I was uh, born in London, Ontario, uh, longer ago than I care to think. Uh, lived there for the first, I don't know, six years or so of my life, I guess. We moved to Dorchester uh, in the uh, pretty close to 1960, before most of Dorchester was built. It was like, I think the population sign at the time said 800. So the town has grown a fair bit since then. I did all my uh, public schooling uh, in Dorchester, Northdale Public School and High School, uh, Dorchester High School, uh, which is now called uh, Lord Dorchester Secondary School. They changed the name right after I graduated, and I'm not sure if there's any relationship there. But anyway, um, went on to a university uh, for a few years, uh, University of Western Ontario, got a Bachelor of Science degree with a biology major. I uh, took flying lessons when I was in university and got my private pilot's license, but uh, so I have some pilot and command time, but I uh, haven't flown for years. Uh, got into the workforce and I got into uh, transportation. And it's one of those businesses that once you're in it, it's very easy to find work in, in other uh, areas of the, uh, of the industry. And, uh, uh, and, and it was interesting. I, I like the transportation business. Every, every day's the same, but every day's different, if you know what I mean. Like all kinds of things happen that can't happen and they, and they happen and people say, well, how can a thing like that happen? It keeps life interesting. Um, so I worked for a lot of, uh, a lot of big, uh, companies in, in this area. I did time as, uh, started out as a courier actually and got to be courier supervisor and went on to a, another company as a, as a safety officer after that in uh, Toronto for the better part of a year, came back uh, to this area and worked for a, a big local company that was mostly in just-in-time auto parts uh, where I became the just-in-time coordinator there. Um, and uh, done various other things, uh, third-party logistics. Uh, I've worked for a company that did a lot of transshipment of, of, of again, auto parts. So that was more um, <clears throat> just in time, but it was cross docking auto parts onto rail cars. So that was a transshipment center that I basically had to get uh, set up and staffed and, and, and manage. Uh, so I've, I've done a lot of things. If, if, if it involves transportation and supply chain logistics, I've probably done it at some point. For the last, most of the last decade of my life, I worked for a, a healthcare consulting company. Uh, as a senior data analyst, and that was mostly spreadsheet work. I think I worked there over nine years, and I don't think I ever met a client in person because it was all, it was all done uh, through the internet with uh, transfer of files and that sort of thing. So I retired uh, in uh, 2014, and uh, since then I've become interested in anything that uh, has to do with science and, and politics, where the politics doesn't really follow the science. The, the, the big thing was climate change. And, and I watched An Inconvenient Truth and I read a book about it and it was pretty alarming stuff. And then I read another book to give the other side of the story because I know from life experience that there's always two sides to a story and the media is giving us one side. And I realized that, that these books and the movie, and all we were getting was it, it wasn't teaching me anything about climate or climate science. What it was teaching me is the polarized points of view of one side sniping at the other. So I wanted to learn about climate and climate science. So I started to do my own research and I've been doing this for years. And I found that the, uh, the real science is, uh, is vastly different from the science that we're, we're getting from the media, from politicians, from so-called their paid experts. Uh, we're not teaching our kids in school or grandkids, uh, depending on your age. The kids in school these days are not getting taught what they should be taught. They're get, getting taught. They're not getting taught to. They're not getting educated. They're getting in, indoctrinated. Um, and I find this rather disturbing. Uh, the Freedom Party uh, uh, was very interested. Uh, their their platform was very much along the lines of my thinking in terms of. Uh, 
of um, all the malfeasance that's going on in, in the climate change discussion. And so I became involved uh, with the Freedom Party. I self-published a book uh, that they were interested in. I've done several uh, online uh, the podcast interviews uh, with, uh, with Bob Metz and Robert Bond at the Freedom Party discussing uh, climate change. And more recently, it's been all the shenanigans that have gone on with COVID and uh, these mRNA vaccines. Okay. Tell me, the, the Freedom Party, where would you say it lands on the spectrum of parties? Obviously, we're to the right of center, but would you, would you place the Freedom Party next to the Conservatives or further right along the spectrum, somewhere around the New Blue or the Ontario Party? Well, first off, I wouldn't consider the Conservatives, the conservatives to be on the right of the spectrum at all. Fair when enough. you look at that, when you look at conservative platforms, whether it's provincial or federal, and then you read... Uh, the platforms of the more leftist parties like the Liberals and the NDP, they're all the same thing. And when you look at um, a lot of socialist programs that have been implemented, the Conservatives have implemented at least as many or more uh, socialist programs as, as have the Liberals. So the Conservatives are not small C Conservative. They may be big C Conservative, but they're small C very much Liberal Socialist. So uh, yes, the Freedom Party stands well to the right of that. What do you say then to those who may be viewing tonight, and, and, and there's often this mindset, and I, I've heard it said recently, that if you're a party to the, right of the, to the party of right of center, <clears throat> therefore you must be racist, bigoted, homophobic, transphobic, and you're just not the party for the modern time. I'm saying none of that describes me at all. And, and it's easy to say things about people, but it's like tr trying to prove a negative uh, to, to argue against it, like, Anybody who knows me knows that none of that applies to me. Um, it's political noise, really. Okay. And, and that's not to say that there aren't people like that that stand on the right of center. But you know what, Dan? There, there are also people like that that stand well on the left of center. I will agree with you there. Let's talk about the leader of the, uh, new, the uh, Freedom Party. Certainly not a lot written about uh, Paul McKeever that I was able to find. Um, unfortunately, he's not included in the debates with the other parties. Um, why, in your opinion, would Paul McKeever make the right choice as Premier for Ontario? Well, for one thing, he's a very honest, straightforward guy. Um, he's, um, his business is uh, in, in employment law. He's a, he's a lawyer. <clears throat> um, and he's a smart guy. He's, uh, he's, I just think he's got his head on straight uh, in terms of uh, what's right and what's wrong in, 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 in a moral and, and just a political uh, aspect, more so than most parties. Let's talk about the platform of the Freedom Party. Um, and looking it over, I see that really its focus is on four pillars of governance, if, uh, if you will, being truth, rights, justice, and freedom. And in reading through it, the one thing I didn't see mention of was that big catch word that all the parties are using right now, which is affordability. And I wanted to ask, how would the Freedom Party of Ontario respond to the affordability issues of life right now in this province? And how would the you and the Freedom Party seek to make life in Ontario more affordable for the average citizen? The position of the Freedom Party <clears throat> is that government can do basically nothing to make life affordable what government does is makes life unaffordable uh they come in with all kinds of regulations everything from rent controls uh minimum wages uh higher taxes anything that that exercises additional control over people's lives makes life less affordable carbon taxes all this sort of thing uh, so the position of the Freedom Party is that government should just get out of the way, let people live their lives, let businesses do their businesses, and, and, and take down all the, all the barriers to people living and, and, and moving freely, interacting freely, to businesses being able to, to conduct business freely, um, and, and reduce the cost burdens on people, and life will become more affordable for everybody. But there seems to be a mentality in government today that, says, that suggests we as citizens aren't smart enough to make those decisions for ourselves and we need government to tell us how to act. 
in order for us to be safe, healthy, happy, successful within the confines of government's prescribed definition. <clears throat> so isn't the Freedom Party notion then running completely counter to what society has evolved to today? I suppose in a lot of ways it is, yes. Um, because we're very much in, in terms of, uh, in favor of terms of like self-sufficiency and independence and it, it's it's the old thing where if you if if you give a person a fish you feed that person for a day but if you teach the person to fish you feed the person for a lifetime uh and and we think people should be responsible uh for their own lives and and we think government should should get out of the way and and basically the purpose of of government is to is to ensure that 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 laws are in place that that protect people from bad things happening and 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 guarantee your your rights your freedoms uh, and your pursuit of happiness let's talk about taxation what would the freedom party's position be on taxation what changes would we could we see if the freedom party were elected on june 2nd i don't know if we've talked specifically about uh about that i mean certainly we would repeal the carbon tax if we were able to, I mean, the, you know, the feds have too much of a say in that sort of thing. So, uh, carbon taxes need to go. Um, I, we would not be in favor of increasing taxes on businesses because increasing taxes on businesses drives them out of the province and that doesn't help, uh, in, increase employment. So, uh, we're already taxed more than enough, like half to death, uh, uh taxes need to, Governments are spending way more than way more than they're taking in. Governments need to stop spending as much, um, and and if they can, if they don't need that as much revenue, then they don't need to take it from Peter to pay Paul. Because when you hear about these parties, they're going to invest, uh, you know, ten or twenty or thirty billion in this and another few dozen billion in that, and and it adds up to, you know, fifty, sixty billion dollars. Uh, over the next four years and and you look at that and you think well all, where's all this money going to come from now on the federal level because it's a national um, nations can print their own money so the federal gov government can say well we'll just print the money which is fine and dandy except that sooner or later inflation is going to catch up with that uh, but sub-sovereign governments can't print their own money so the only the only place um the ontario government can get money from is from you and me as taxpayers so you look at all this stuff and you say okay well that's that's lovely that you're going to spend all our money on these things but who's going to pay the bill for this and as you get more and more people that are living um basically on government largesse and you get fewer and fewer people that are working uh, there comes a time when I think it was Maggie Thatcher said the problem with socialism is sooner or later you run out of other people's money. Um, so uh, taxes are, are are a really big issue at, at at all levels, and it's it's not just like carbon taxes; it's uh, property taxes. Um, I I don't think there's a specific plan in place. Uh, for the party that, that I know of that, that that lays it all out in very specific detail because that would be what pages and pages of stuff to read through so but in general uh, we would favor reduced taxation because that gives people more disposable income and having more disposable income makes things more affordable on that note, we have to go to a short break. Do stay okay. tuned. I have a lot more questions for Dave Plum, the Freedom Party candidate for Algon Middlesex London in the upcoming provincial election. We'll be right back. Welcome back to In the Know. I'm your host, Dan Reith, and we're continuing our Meet the Candidate session. Uh, today, we're visiting with Dave Plum, the Freedom Party candidate for Algon Middlesex London. Mr. Plum, just before break, we spoke about taxation. I want to ask, um, and looking through the platform specifically, and I, I touched on the four pillars of governance, truth, rights, justice, and freedom. But one thing that jumped out at me, there was a lot of commentary about COVID, and in particular, the COVID Truth and Reconciliation Inquiry. Why is that beneficial to Ontarians, should the Freedom Party be uh, brought to power? 
Well, we don't believe this whole pandemic thing should ever have happened. Certainly, uh, mRNA vaccines should never have been mandated for people to, uh, to take them. Uh, the concern is that this issue is going to go away for a little while because we have a provincial issue or a provincial election here uh, coming up in June. We have a provincial election in Quebec coming up in October. And I mean, these are what two Canada, Canada's two most populous provinces, I think. Um, so with, with so many Canadians going to the polls over the next few months, the provincial governments are laying low. They don't want to do any more lockdowns and mandates and, and, and forced injections and all this sort of thing because they're afraid of losing votes. But what I'm saying is wait till November, December, January next year and watch for COVID-22 coming around because COVID-19 worked so well for them to, to, to put the screws to people to close down businesses, to put people out of work, to make people far more dependent on the government, which basically makes things less affordable for everybody, uh, that they love the power. They're not going to want to give that up. So uh, our concern is that this is going to become a repetitive thing. We, thing. we have a, we, uh, the protocol has now been established for any virus coming around Oh my God, a few people died. Let's lock down everything. Let's get the masks out. Let's start the injections and all that sort of thing. Now, I mentioned I have a Bachelor of Science uh, degree that's decades old at this point, but I don't think viruses have changed that much. And people have challenged me on this uh, vaccine thing. They said, you know, well, are you a virologist or an immunologist? And I said, no, I'm not. So they said, well, you know, then how, how do you justify not taking the vaccine? So I asked them, are you a virologist or an immunologist? Well, no, they're not. Well, how do you justify taking it? You know, that sort of cuts both ways. And most of the people that are criticizing me for not wanting to take the mRNA vaccines uh are nowhere near as, as well formally educated in, in science and biology as I am. So when I heard messenger RNA, which I learned in, in university is like a gene editing molecule. And, and, uh, uh, and I heard that, you know, being in, injected it. And, and, and the other thing I heard was no product liability. So we're going to inject this stuff into you. That's likely to do something about editing genes, but, if anything goes wrong, you're on your own. <laughs> That's like two really scary things. Now, there's a new vaccine out. It's Novavax. Uh, the brand is, uh, that's the company, Nuvaxavid, is a protein, uh, what they call a protein subunit vaccine that's based on technology that's been out there since the mid-1980s. I've taken that, uh, but I won't take the messenger RNA vaccines, and we don't think these things should be forced on anybody who doesn't want to take them. So our concern is that this is, this is going to keep happening if people are not called to account for forced vaccinations, for people being fired who didn't want to be vaccinated. I mean, th this is an egregious invasion of, uh, of, of your freedoms. Let's talk about a limp, the point that says eliminate rationing or preventing health care access. Now, the notion that Ontario and Canada has a rationed healthcare system is in fact a reality based on the fact we have socialized medicine. Um, we can do nothing but ration it. Um, and it's been that way for a long time. How would the Freedom Party, if brought to power on June 2nd, el um, eliminate rationing of healthcare? Back in the old days, we had something called OHIP, the Ontario Health Insurance uh, Plan. Mm -hmm. where health care was covered by an insurance policy, basically. And that's no longer true. Not, what we have now is uh, medical welfare, um, where we have free health care, only nothing's free. We, the taxpayers, are paying for all this. And, and there's this, no, uh, this hesitant, this, this actually uh, more than a hesitancy on the part of, of the major parties. They will not permit what they call two-tiered health care. Uh, because that would put private enterprise into competition with the public system. Uh, now, the fact is, Dan, two-tiered health care is happening, okay? The, the only thing is it's happening in places like Mexico and the United States and Indonesia, where people here who can afford to, to make other arrangements for uh, hip and knee replacements and that sort of thing, they're going out of the country. It's called medical tourism. 
They're going out of the country to have it done. And the difference is that instead of employing people here uh, at, who pay taxes and, and, and improving our own economy by doing the second tier of healthcare here in Canada, all, all our two tier healthcare is happening out of the country. So a, a big step, I think, in, in improving the healthcare uh, system uh, for with accessibility, particularly, um, is to is to allow free enterprise. So you could have ortho clinics and you could have dental clinics and that sort of thing that are free enterprise, uh, where you could have like health insurance plans that are personal health insurance plans like Blue Cross, that sort of thing. Other than other than OHIP, mm -hmm. where people of means and there are plenty of them in in the province could go and get their things done and take the pressure off the public system that that now has to basically handle everything because there, there's no other alternative. The notion of a two-tiered system is certainly nothing new in Ontario or Canada, but it strikes such a fear in to many. Why do you think that is? Why, why, why do you think that no one's willing to, to even explore the alternative view that if there is a two-tier healthcare system, those with means can pay for it, leaving lines of access open to those who can't? It's always painted with a brush that, well, once we have two tier, all the money is gonna to go to the private sector. And, and that's the problem. That's it, the way things are being painted. It's like, it's like climate change. Um, there's, there's very little truth in what, what we're hearing from politicians and from uh, the mainstream media um, in terms of, of, of these things that it all seems to be, um, that if, if they can make people fearful, then they have control over the people and, and, and the people would just go along like, like sheep and, and agree with everything and keep paying their taxes and keep behaving themselves and all that sort of thing. So um, I, I, it, it, it baffles me though, that, that people can't see this and can't figure it out for themselves. But I mean, for, for the last uh, generation or more in, in in, in the public school and the high school system, people have been programmed with all these socialist ideas that uh, that the government, is, it's okay to have government as a big brother taking care of everything for you. You don't have to be responsible for anything yourself. And we just don't see it that way. We've only got about four minutes left. I wanna talk about uh, uh, a comment that was also made in the platform about defend free speech and prohibit forced speech. Can you explain that? Well, yeah, four speeches. Uh, that that was what uh, Professor Peter Peterson was 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 all about. Where you've got an individual who wants to be addressed as they or them or something like that. It's uh, and he says, no, you are. If you're male, you're he, and if you're female, you're she. You're not. You're not they or them. <laughs> but but the government and and uh, academic institutions now are trying to force people like uh, Dr. Peterson to, to go against their beliefs to, to say, well, you have to address this individual as a they. And that's forced speech. And, and in terms of uh, prohibiting free speech, well, when you try to post anything uh, in, in social media that, that contradicts the government's uh, um, point of view on just about anything, COVID, climate change, whatever, you, you get your, your website uh, deplatformed, demonetized. I mean, you're forcibly um, censored. You're shut up. I mean, we're not allowed to hear both sides of the story anymore. We're only allowed to hear one side of the story. And if people are not permitted to hear the other side of the story, they can't rationally decide what they should believe. Thank you, Dave. We're down to our last minute and a half, and I want to give you the opportunity now to for your uh, closing remarks and, and convince us all why Dave Plum and the Freedom Party is the right candidate to vote for on June 2nd. I think, we'll, I think we will appeal to people who are really ticked off about what's been going on in Ontario for the last 15 years with McGinty and Wynn and the Green Energy Act. And I mean, we're starting to see the end, end result now with that. I mean, pull up to the gas pumps and that's where that's taken us with carbon taxes and everything. Uh, and then, of course, with all the lockdowns and uh, all the shenanigans, uh, mandates and everything that went on with Doug Ford, uh, people want a, a, the opportunity to 
to say we want something different. Uh, and what I've said before is that there's a law of life that says the more you do of what you're doing, the more you'll get of what you've got. So the message is that if you're really, really happy with all the stuff that's been going on politically in Ontario for the last 15 years, keep voting for the big three parties because you'll keep getting what you've got. But if you're really unhappy about it and you don't want to vote for any of the big three parties, but you don't know what else to do, you don't want to just spoil your ballot or, or decline your ballot because that doesn't send a message to anybody, then vote for a party like the Freedom Party uh, who stands for, uh, for freedom, for something different than what you've been getting for the last 15 years. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that one of the smaller parties has to be elected to office. What it does do is it sends a message to the big parties uh, to say, hey, look, a certain percentage of people voted against you by casting a vote for the Freedom Party. Uh, and maybe you should uh, pay attention to that. I mean, after the last election, when the Conservatives didn't really have a platform because they were too busy sorting out leadership prior to the election, um, the Freedom Party and the Conservative local conservative representatives, Jeff Year being the most recent one, have always had a really good relationship. So they looked at our platform and started implementing all kinds of stuff out of our platform. We said, that's great. Yeah. But people- Dave, yeah. I unfortunately have, have, have to cut you there. We're, we're down to our last few seconds. So I have to thank you for being on, on the show. Thank okay. you everyone for watching. On behalf of myself and Rogers, we wish you much success in the upcoming campaign and all the best of luck on June 2nd. If you want to learn more about the Freedom Party and or the candidate Dave Plum, go to freedomparty.on.ca. Thank you for watching and you are in the know. Take care.